In this video, I'm going to explain the basics of propagation delay. Propagation delay is the idea that real gates don't switch instantaneously. That there's some time between when we change the input to a circuit and its outputs change. And these are due to the fact that our gates are built out of real materials and electrons can't propagate through these circuits instantaneously. If we have an example circuit like this inverter, its input A may change at one time, what we'll call T0, and its output B would change at a later time, what we'll call T1, and the difference between these two is the propagation delay, or T propagation, representing some finite amount of time between when the input changes and the output changes. It turns out, in the general case, propagation delay is very complicated, and there's a number of reasons for this. First, the delay from one input, say x, to the output can be different based on whether x transitions from 0 to 1 than from when x transitions from 1 to 0. Furthermore, the delay from one input, x, to the output, z, could differ from the delay from y to z. In addition, the more things that I attach to this circuit changes the amount of time it takes that circuit to switch. So if this NAND gate is only driving a single inverter, it might switch quickly, but as I attach additional circuits to the output of this NAND gate, it'll take longer to switch. And finally, if there's long wires that connect this circuit to another circuit, those long wires can add capacitance and resistance, which again cause this NAND gate to take longer to switch. So computing propagation delay in the general case is relatively complicated, but for the purpose of this class, we can consider propagation delay to be a much simpler thing, and we're going to make two simplifying assumptions to make our work easier. First is that for a given gate, we're going to say the delay is constant from any input to the output. And second, we're going to ignore fan out and wire delay. So let's consider a more complicated example of computing propagation delay. In this picture, I'm showing the full adder with inputs x, y, and carry in, and its output sum and carry out. And we're going to make assumptions about the propagation delays of the individual gates. And these are arbitrary numbers, but ones just to make the example relatively clean. So we're going to assume that OR gates take 10 picoseconds, our AND gates have a 20 picosecond propagation delay, and our XOR gates, because they're a little more complicated, have a delay of 40 picoseconds. So I'm showing here on the bottom a timing diagram, which is a way to show the value of multiple cycles evolving over time. And so on the x-axis here, I'm showing time increasing to the right. And initially, x, y, and cn all have the value 0. And at time 0, I'm going to change x to the value 1. And then I'm going to hold that value for the rest of the example. With y and cn, I'm just going to hold their values at 0 throughout the whole example. So we want to see what effect this change has on the circuit. And so we know x is connected to this XOR gate, and I'm going to call the output of this XOR gate A. And so we know A isn't going to change for at least 40 picoseconds. That up until time 40, we know A's value is not going to change. That when x and y were both 0, the output of the XOR gate is 0, and it's going to stay that way until 40 picoseconds after A changes. And at that point, the effect of x changing can be seen on this output. So now x is 1 and y is 0, so the output of this XOR gate is 1, and since x and y don't change again, we're going to hold this output value for the rest of the example. Similarly, the output of the AND gate I'm going to call B, and we know it's not going to change for 20 picoseconds. After 20 picoseconds, the change in x could affect b, but in this case, x is 1 and y is 0, so the output of this AND gate stays 0. The output of this XOR gate is the value of sum, and we know that it can't change before a changes, so for the first 40 picoseconds, it doesn't change. Then when a changes, 
its propagation delay of this XOR gate is going to be another 40 picoseconds up to 80. And at that point, the output of the XOR gate could affect S. So let's compute the new value of this XOR gate. A has the value 1 and carry in has the value 0. So 1 XOR with 0 is 1, so the value does change. So let's look at the output of this AND gate. We'll call that C. C's inputs are A and carry in, which initially were both zeros, so the AND of those things is zero. And that's going to hold its value for quite some time until A changes. We know that C is not going to change its value. And then it's going to be another 20 picoseconds after A changes. So we know it's going to hold its value at least until time 60. And again, A is now 1. And carry in is still 0. So the AND of 1 and 0 remains 0. So this signal is going to stay 0 for the whole example. And finally, carry out is the OR of C and B. Well, C and B are both 0 for the whole example. And so carry out is going to be 0 for the whole example. So what do we see? We see that by changing x at time 0, we have a change in s at time 80. But carry out doesn't change at all for this change in x. So in general, when we consider one of these propagation delay problems, we're concerned about finding the longest path through a circuit. And maybe that's from any input to any output. And the way we do this is we compute for every particular input the longest path from it to the output. And so we'll do that for x to s. So if x changes at time 0, we know that its output is going to change at time 40. That's the earliest that its output could change. And similarly, it could affect the output of the AND gate at time 20. That means that the output of this XOR gate, or S, is going to be 40 time units after that change. Because the other input to that XOR gate is C in, which isn't changing in this analysis. And so we can see that there's one path from X to S, and it has time 80 time units. And so we have a delay of 80 on that path. If we look at the other output, C out, we see that there's two paths that lead from x to that output. And one of those we already know. We already know that the input, the bottom input of the OR gate arrives 20 picoseconds after x changes. The top input changes, well, its input changes 40 picoseconds after x changes. And therefore, its output is going to change 60 picoseconds. And since we're looking for the longest path, we're going to consider when both outputs are stable, which is 60 picoseconds after x changes. And so the output C out is going to stabilize 70 picoseconds after x changes. So x to C out is going to be 70. And it turns out that the circuit is symmetric with respect to x with y. And so we're going to see a similar 80 and 70 picosecond latency from y to s and from y to c out. But for c in, it's a little different. When the input c in changes at time 0, that's going to change the output of this AND gate at time 20 and the output of the XOR gate at time 40. So the latency between c in and s is 40 picoseconds. And then there's another 10 picoseconds after this 20, so the delay from C in to C out is 30. So in this way, we're going to look for every path from the input and find the longest to the output. Let's consider an even more complicated example, that of our 32-bit ALU. What's likely to be the longest path through this circuit? If I'm considering from any data input to any data output, well, I'd expect it to be some path that enters in the first bit and follows the whole carry chain to the output. And it turns out it's the signal that starts from the B input of the first bit and out through the output. 
So we may want to know how long this path takes because that's going to determine how fast our processor is. So this path consists of three components. One is the propagation time from B to the output carry out. So we have one times the propagation delay from B to carry out. And then we have 30 copies of the propagation delay from carry in to carry out. And finally, we have one copy of the propagation delay from carry in to the output. So our next step is to figure out how long each of these subcomponent times are based on our one bit ALU. So given some assumptions about the propagation delays of the individual components that make up our one bit adder, we can compute the propagation delay of each of the components of the total delay of our 32-bit adder. So starting with our propagation from B to carry out, from the B input to the carry out output, there is a single path through the circuit. This path takes us through the XOR gate, where the latency of 30 picoseconds, and through the full adder from the B input to the C output for a latency of 90 picoseconds. We then have 30 times the latency of propagating through the carry in to the carry out output. Again, from the carry in input to the carry out output, there is a single path that goes through the full adder from the C input to the C output with a latency of 60 picoseconds. And finally, we add one times the propagation delay from the carry in input to the output. And here, because we're doing arithmetic, we expect control two to have the value of zero, which means we're looking at this path through the multiplexer, which means again, there's a single path from the input to the output. And this path, takes the C in input to the sum output of the full adder for 30 picoseconds plus the data input to the output path through the multiplexer for another 60 picoseconds. And so now we can just sum up all of these components for a total of 2,010 picoseconds. So it turns out that delay is bad. It's really, really bad. And processors don't really implement their adders this way. This is what's called a ripple carry adder, which because the carry chain goes through every bit of the adder has a latency order n, where n is the number of bits being added together. So in our 32-bit adder, we had delay, which is proportional to the delay of each adder times 32. That it turns out that there's much smarter ways of handling carries. One popular design is what's called a carry look ahead adder. And this is something that you can Google if you're curious. But it has a latency that is proportional to the log base 2 of the number of bits. And it turns out to be only slightly larger than the adder that we're designing in this class. But we won't cover that in this class because our focus is really on the function of a processor and not on the building of efficient processors.